Hello, everybody. My name is Ataba Garcia Swayzicki, and I'm coming to you from occupied and unceded Tewa Pueblo territory, southern Tewa Pueblo, otherwise known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'm here to share a presentation a little bit on herbal history uh, as it relates to the history of the incredible legacy and tradition that comes from Mexico. A lot of this is based on my own life experience and a book I just wrote, which I'll share about in the, in the end of this presentation, but really want to share with more um, the wider herbal community, um, something that I think often gets overlooked and forgotten about the, the contribution and the advances that come from the traditions in, in Mexico. So um, I will introduce myself in a moment with the first slide more thoroughly. Um, so like I said, this presentation is called so Xochitl. I'm learning how to say Nahuatl. It's the, or speak Nahuatl. It's the a language of you know, millions of people in, in central Mexico very ancient language, a mother language, and that means flower. The translation is flower, and in the center, this is a glyph of the 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 Xochitl as it appears in the Mexica sunstone, kind of incorrectly known as the Aztec calendar, but it's the giant stone that is actually a a way to going to map the movement of the sun and the moon and of Venus. And part of that is a 20-day a way of counting time, you know, which gets called like a ventana or like a month. And, and Xochitl is the last um, glyph in this, or last day in this calendar, and it represents the flowering of potential, of possibility, of a peak of an energy or an experience. It represents beauty creativity. Um, I really feel like it's the heart of the tradition of, of our herbal practices that come from Mexico. So, um, so my name, like I said, is Atava Garcia Suizuki. Um I have ancestors from central Mexico in the area of Guanajuato. Um, I also have ancestors from New Mexico, where I'm living now, that are Diné or Navajo, and as well as Slavic ancestors from what's now called Poland, and ancestors from Hungary. A lot of my life was searching for the medicine of my ancestors that didn't know more about their traditions, and over 20 years ago, more like 25 years ago, I, I got on the path of studying curanderismo, which is the traditional Mexican medicine, by meeting my first maestras, Doña Enriqueta Contreras of Oaxaca, Estela Roman from Cuernavaca, who really opened my eyes and heart to this, this beautiful, beautiful tradition. So uh, what this presentation is about is going to be more history as it relates to herbalism, but I do always like to honor the ancestors of this tradition, my ancestors, the ancestors of my teachers, and and all of the people on in, in Mexico whose lives were lost or who risked their lives to keep these practices alive through 500 years of colonization. I feel like that's something we can't take lightly especially in these political times that we, we may be able to practice herbal medicine freely now, but um, you know, throughout history, people have been accused of, of witchcraft and you know, persecuted and killed for their practices um, all around the world and, and also in Mexico. Um, so my intention for this presentation is just to share a little bit of the history that excites me and maybe will excite you. Um, there's many more things I, I could share and hopefully future presentations. So I'm going to zero in on, uh, so well, I, I'll first say, you know, just honor the ancestors. Give a moment to that. And then I'm going to zero in on a, a, a point in time, about 30 years, 30, 40 years after 
the moment of colonization where Fernan Cortez and his soldiers came to Veracruz and then to Tenochtitlan, which is modern day Mexico City, and really <laughs> destroyed an incredibly advanced, sophisticated civilization. You know, they burned built buildings, destroyed libraries, burned books, killed people. You know, millions of people died either in, in the warfare, the inhumane conditions, and also uh, the ensuing smallpox epidemic, which was in many cases introdu intentionally introduced to people. So after that period, after that horrible period, oh, um, you know, the, the Spanish came and a lot of Catholic monks came and started schools to educate and convert the natives, the indigenous people. And one was a school in, in, in Mexico City um, that was for young boys. And at that point, um, you know, the dean of the school wanted to impress the king of Spain. So they, they you know, commissioned that this book documenting the herbal practices that were, again, hundreds or thousands of years old, but, you know, still being practiced in, in Mexico at that time, the herbal medicine practices. So this became the, the, the Codex, the Codice de la Cruz Bandiana, or the um, uh, Codex of, it also gets called the oldest herbal text in the Americas, or is the oldest herbal text in the Americas. It has another translation from Latin, which is like the little book of the medicine of the Indians. Um, so this book was um, written in 1552 by a, a Nahuatl, in Nahuatl, uh, by a, a Nahuatl or Mexica um, indigenous doctor. I always like to think of them as Martin de la Cruz as a herbalist. Uh, he wrote it, and I believe he also was the one who wrote, did, drew these beautiful, colorful, captivating illustrations of the medicinal plants. And I have this slide here so that you can just see some of the color and the richness. Um, so each page described the plants, and, and in Latin and in Nahuatl, it, it described a little bit of, of the use, like this plant was used for pain or for for um, skin diseases or for sleep. It, it's a pretty sparse text in terms of, you know, the descriptions of, of the use of plants, but it, it is, I still think it's a treasure because it is a, a doorway into a, a, a world of medicinal plants that I certainly didn't learn about in herb school and I think more of us need to know about. So um, Juan Bandiano translated it into Latin. He was also uh, an indigenous man, you know, educated by the Catholic monks at the school. Uh, one of the curious things about the book is that all of the Aztec, or really more correctly, Mexica medical theory was it omitted because Again, all of the indigenous practices, the ways of praying, the ways of doing ceremony, the ways of healing were seen through the eyes of the colonizers or the eyes of the Spanish who had no framework or no perspective except to think that it was the devil's work or, you know, sacrilegious. Um, I want to say, just as a caveat, that's not true. <laughs> um, it was just about a, a misunderstanding, but that became a real systematic way of, of really a persecution and forcing people to convert to a religion in order to survive. So anyways, um, so interestingly in this, in this medical text, unfortunately, or I would say unfortunately, probably some of the juiciest, most important information about really how the, the, the Mexica people who uh, like viewed medicine, viewed um, the human body, viewed plant medicine, um, you know, that was not there because, you know, they didn't want to upset the, the Catholics. Um, so another interesting thing is that, you know, as, as uh, historians have studied this text, they've also noticed that a lot of the ways 
the description of plants or the uses of plants definitely have a, a, an influence that comes from Spain and Europe. So, um, of course, this is almost 40 years after first contact of the Spanish in Mexico. So, of course, at, over all those years, especially since they, there was such a calculated uh, destruction and rampage and eradication of the indigenous culture and people, and then a very strong enforcement of the, the beliefs that came from Spain. Um, of course, that would have permeated into this work. Or maybe these, these writers of it felt like we have to put it in there because that will be acceptable. Um, and also some of it, it, it's thought that maybe that it was even fabricated and um, not like, again, authentic medicine or original medicine or traditional medicine. And I personally think that some of these two men, this is my version of history, is that these two men were rebellious and they were making stuff up just because it was a way to like <laughs> get a jab at the colonizers. I don't know if that's true, but maybe it is, right? We don't know. Um, so the, the pictures are beautiful. The names are, again, primary and primarily in Nahuatl. Um, oops. I want to um, highlight just a few plants that are very common or probably well, most well known today that were in this codex. Um, and one is the, the nopal cactus, also called prickly pear, op, op, opuntia, um, tlatonochtli in Nahuatl. So this was written about in the text. Um, I cannot read the Latin what its description says, but I just want to say, you know, again, the nopal is a, a very ancient, and you know, plant used for food and for medicine and for um, dye and for uh, many things, you know, since antiquity in Mexico. Another plant that is in this codex was uh, Detura Tolomashimitl, <laughs> uh, which in Spanish I know they call Toloache, um, but this is sacred Detura, a very poisonous plant. <laughs> that does have psychoactive properties and very few people I think know how to work with it responsibly so don't ever take it internally. Um, how it was used back then at least according to the codex I don't, I don't read Latin but I can read enough I know Spanish enough to know that the Latin here says contra laterum dolorem which I'm translating to against it works against pain, which is still a use of Detora today topically as a as a um, as an oil or as an infused um, liniment. It's a really incredible analgesic, but again, use with caution, label it really well so no one ever takes it internally. Um, here are just some other pictures from the codex just so you can get excited and inspired. Um, there have been translations. I have a vision, since I get to say it on this Herb Rally podcast, that I really have a vision of a project that brings herbalists and traditional people, especially traditional Nahuatl-speaking people from Mexico, coming together to actually work with this text to not only translate it, but to bring it back into as a living herbal document that we actually work with and use. Um, I think it has a lot to offer. There's, you know, dozens of plants that are, you know, plant monographs in here, and I think it is a part of our herbal history that uh, I want to help, you know, kind of bring back to its important, give it space. Um, so I just want to segue to talk about a few plants that are in the codex, although I don't have the images of them. I just use what I could find in Wikipedia that are, you know, copyright free. Um, but one of the most, well, anyways, some plants that are, you know, been used since antiquity, you know, the, the flowers, the medicinal plants of Mexico, but that we are still very much a part of our herbal traditions today and our curanderismo traditions today. And one of the most important species that I've discovered, you know, throughout Mexico are, are the, or sorry, the genus is the, the Tajetis genus. 
really has, you know, since antiquity, again, for hundreds and thousands of years, been used as medicinal plants, as ceremony plants, as food, a lot of, you know, spiritual associations with these plants. And uh, this is one uh, that it gets called Flor de Muerto or Sempao Sochil. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And this is a plant that even people outside of Mexican or Mexican-American culture maybe are familiar with because it's become very popular, popularized in Day of the Dead or Day of los Muertos. It's a plant we use on our altars. It has an incredible presence, its aroma, its color. It really uplifts the spirits when we feel sad, you know, when we're grieving our loved ones. It also is a plant, like when you cut it, it even if it's not in water, it, it maintains its vitality, its vibrancy, its aroma, its color for days after, um, you know, after being harvested, even if it's not in um, water, like you can see in the background here of this image, there's like the garlands of the, of the marigolds. Um, so I feel like that relates to its energy of, kind of the immortality of spirit or the way that through memory, through these rituals, through telling the stories of our loved ones that, that, that they remain alive. I feel like this plant is the perfect plant for that. Um, so it brings comfort in times of grief and loss. I use it a lot, you know, as a bath or as a limpia. A baño is a traditional like bath we do in curanderismo with flowers and herbs to like cleanse. This, the energy, but also to like help the emotions. Um, so it really helps with sadness and depression and susto, which is a kind of fear or shock. Um, on a physical level, it's really good for digestion. So it's a really important plant. Again, since antiquity, it's in the codex and it's you know very much continued to modern times. Another relative, another Tajetis genus plant relative of the Sempao Xochil is um, what gets called in Spanish pericon or uh, English Mexican tarragon, Tejetis lucida, and in Nahuatl the yahuitl. And this is a beautiful plant that I learned about from um, grandmother Flor de Mayo, who's a, a Mayan elder who's part of the Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. And she talked about it as it being the grandmother plant, the plant that teaches all other plants how to use its medicine. And I became very intrigued with it, so I wanted to learn more about it. Um, so I've done research, um, and it's definitely used up to, it, to this day in many ceremonies in, in Mexico, including the, the feast day of now, it's called San Miguel, but pre-Catholicism was a uh, feast day to Tlaloc, the energy that presides on the rain. And I do want to say a little coll a correction to my slide. I hear I have Tlaloc, deity of the rain, but um, more recently have been taught by some of my maestros that in, in ancient Mexico that we didn't have these concepts of gods, that that's really a European concept. So they were more just really naming the energy of the forces of nature. So. It's really Tlaloc, the energy of the rain. Um, so this also, similar to the other Tejetis, um, um, oh, I didn't say that's Tejetis erecta, the last Tejetis, but Tejetis lucida also helps all, helps heal many emotions, but especially sadness and grief. And again, these bright yellow and orange colors, you know, they uplift the spirit. It's just, it's color therapy, right? But it's also aromatherapy because it does have that really pungent, like tarragon-like smell, kind of sweet. Um, I consider this to be a curandera plant. Actually, I consider all of the Tejetis plants to be curandera plants. Like they just, by working with them, by meditating with them, by dreaming with them, they teach us about their medicine. Um, this one, you know, the name Tejetis lucida, it, it does help with the dream state and brings more lucidity. Like a lucid dream is when you awake in your dream when you're aware that you're dreaming while you dream, but it also will help with dream recall. It brings healing in dreams. Um, 
on a physical level. It's also warming and good for digestion and has a whole other, many, many, many other physical uses. Um, there was a article in the American Herbalist Guild Journal, uh, La Abuelita's Favorite Remedy, which is all about pericon, so I have a little link here. But we use it, can use it as a flower essence, as a tea, as a tincture in baños. They say that this ritual baths in limpias, which are cleansing of the body, where we make a bundle of the herbs and we brush it around the body, usually to release something, but we can do limpias as blessings, as rites of passages. And the last plant I want to talk about is um, Tejeri's lemonii, which grows all around um, the Bay Area and um, traditional Ohlone uh, territory. Um, and really, at, when I first learned about Tejeri's lucida, I learned that its sister, its sibling, her cousin species, was growing literally as a bush outside my door. This is also native to uh, more northern Mexico and also now what's considered the, the U.S. Southwest, which of course once was a territory of Mexico. Um, we also call this the grandmother plant, and it's a, again a, a really beautiful plant for um, for using for limpias, for blessings. If you do a bath with it, um, it will turn your water bright yellow. So it's a very powerful um, and healing plant and also one that's indigenous to Mexico. I don't know if this one was in the Codex Bandiana de la Cruz. So just for some further information, oops, oh, here's the slide. Or, you know, just again to expand the awareness of like the heritage of the plants that come from Mexico. I mean, Mexico has incredible biodiversity. There's two coastal coastal regions, like regions Atlantic and Pacific. It has high desert, it has jungle, um, and you know everything in between. So there's an incredible biodiversity of people, animals, and plants. But I just want to name some of the other plants that have been gifted us to us from Mexico that we use as herbs, as food, as medicine. Um, chocolate, corn, vanilla, chile, chia, nopal, or prickly pear, epazote, which also gets called wormwood, worm seed, not wormwood, worm seed, avocados, mugwort, which of course is indigenous to so many continents of, of Mother Earth. It also, there's native species to Mexico, include yarrow, there's different sages. Um, the blue elderberry, which in English gets called Mexican elderberry, um, is also native to Mexico. In, in Spanish, it's called sauco. Um, me, the Mexico also gets us with peyote, um, magnolia, dahlias, I think it's misspelled there, zinnia, plumeria, tomatoes, and, and hundreds and hundreds more. So I just want to honor, you know, the vastness of this tradition. And this is uh, an image from another codex, which shows um, the different energies of each direction. And, each, and, and there's also a sacred tree in each direction. I'm also on a, a expedition or mission to figure out the, you know, which, the, which are the trees in this, in this image. So um, yeah, I just want to thank you all so much for listening to my presentation. I recently published my first book called The Curanderics Toolkit, Reclaiming Ancestral Latinx Plant Medicine and Rituals for Healing. A lot of that info from the slideshow is in the book and much, much more. I talk about limpias, I talk about dream work, I talk about the, the sacred energies, um, so if you're interested, you can find it, I would say, at your local independent bookstore, or you can buy it from my publisher, Heyday. Um, you can find me on my website, ancestralapothecary.com. There's also the school that I founded in Oakland that I'm passing on the steward stewardship to called Ancestral Apothecary School, which will soon have a new name, but you can also look up Ancestral Apothecary School on, on the internet and um, on Instagram, I'm at Kudendetics Toolkit. So thank you so much for watching this presentation.